While you guys are settling in, I'll leave up my one internet meme that I hope I'll be remembered for by. It's called the Midas Rule. Whoever touches something first and cares the most gets to decide what to do with it. Probably something familiar to you that work in tech spaces, work with other people. Um, actually, this was created. Stan was on a project. And a couple of you were on a project that I was part of called the Community Power Tools. And I, I invented that. The saying because of Stan and a couple others, and I'll explain in just a moment. Okay. I'll start with this. Whoever touches something first takes the initiative and cares the most gets to decide what to do with it. So as you see my presentations and you meet other people, you'll find that these are the people most interested in improving things, making things better, coming out to connect. So I want to thank you all for, for coming here. This has a story behind it, this saying. We were working on power tools. This is a community project extension for the Tritian site side. And people kept asking, hey, can I work on this? Can I make a schema documenter? Can I make the schema synchronizer? All this kind of functionality. And my point was, yes, it's open source. So yes, you can start something. And giving yourselves the permission to come up, present, to connect, uh, I think that's probably one of the most challenging things that we do, just getting started. So with that, let's get started. Apparently, I'm supposed to tell you how we're modernizing the user interface of SDL Trity and Sites. No pressure. I'm a product owner. My name is Alvin Reyes. If you can tell from my accent, I grew up in California. San Diego, uh, to be precise. I love the community. I started as a customer and um, started sharing about the product. I eventually, I won an award for sharing. I joined PS. They were happy to have me for a couple of years. I might have been on some of your projects. And now I'm a product owner. I'm a product owner. It's, it's the dream job. I've told people it's like the Excel geek that got to work for Microsoft, uh, but in an SDL context. And with that, let me, let me just get a feel for the room. How many people here are in a, uh, a technical role? Technical, semi-technical? So it looks 50 percentage. How many are, are functional? Functional, mostly functional business analysis. OK, three, three. How many are both? So the Venn diagram. Oh, OK, OK. So we have, so it's more like this. So out of everybody here, Half of you are technical, and some of you are, are functional, and the other half, can someone tell me why the other half is here? <laughs> um, yeah, so that I want to get, how many people are familiar with our uh, sites, Tridian sites, SDL web technology, from that kind of background? And on the doc side, structured content, knowledge center, give me the other names. <laughs> Anything else? Language? You know, coming from a, from a purely language side, so I can tell you why you want sites and docs. Okay. All right. So most, most split 50-50 sites and docs. All right. So my background comes from community, really. Working with enterprise software, there are a million questions. A lot of it not even related to the product itself. And there was this community on Tridian World where you can ask and answer questions. I thought it was nice. So I started asking questions over and over again to the point where I knew the answer. So then I started giving the answers, and I won an award. And this award is the SDL Tridian MVP Award. It's a program developed to thank and recognize great professionals who freely share their knowledge, real world experience, and objective feedback to help others. And it's given annually. And we have some MVPs, at least one here. Robert Collette said he's going to show, but he's not here, so I'm making fun of him right now. Frank Taylor, are you here? So he's in the other room. OK, well, when you see Frank Ta Taylor, make sure you go, hi, Frank Taylor. Th thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. If he was here, I would embarrass him, tell him some funny stories, but uh, I'll save that for later. We can still do that. 
All right, so I'll tell you a, st a funny story for Frank Taylor. Frank Taylor is one of the few people in the world that have treating expertise and front-end skills. And I had to convince him that, hey, you know, you're special. You're, you're unique in that sense. A lot of people don't know both. And uh, I think he, he's learned that, embraced that. And if you want to see some of his thoughts from a business analysis project perspective, go check out his presentation uh, during the rest of Connect. Okay, so that was the first part of my agenda. I have a demo, and I'm hoping the demo gods are nice to me today. I'll also have a demo on my iPad, so I have to pray especially hard to the demo gods. Then I'll talk a little bit about Sites9 and beyond. If you have questions, feel free to mention things. I might put some things on the board, and if we have time, or if you have to ask a particularly hard question, I'll have you come up and help me uh, get the answer together. A caveat, everything you're seeing is work in progress. This is new UI work for Trading Insights. Some of these elements are, will also be in docs for next year, 2020, first half of 2020. Okay, so this is not part of 9.1, but if you want to see, uh, get access or learn about this, you can uh, contact or talk to me afterwards. We have a research program that we can invite you to where we'll ask for sample data, show you some things. We just recently finished a usability trial uh, with our users. So we do have an active and ongoing research program. So let me show you in context editing first. With one second. OK. I, I stole some stuff from the pre-sales demo, if you guys recognize the, the theme. Let's start Experience uh, Manager. So what's Experience Manager? This is in-context editing of the website for the staging website before things go live. This lets your editors come in, make changes to a page, some content, and then uh, preview what it would look like before it goes live. So that's what in-context editing is. We have a little button here to get started. And actually, that button has a small Easter egg. If you, it's actually movable and configurable. So when we actually working with the team, when this first came up, uh, the button was over the logo. I said, no, 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 customers are not going to like that if we're covering the logo. So what we did, and our, our develop developer and designers are so clever, they said, okay, here you go, product owner. It's now, moves, now movable. I said, oh, okay. I didn't Can think that. It? Could you hide it? Um, it's enabled or not for your staging site. So if the user has the ability to edit content, then it shows. But it doesn't show on your live site. So that's uh, how that button works. Okay, so now I have content. Tridian Sites content is modular pieces of content that you can put together and assemble on a page. You can move content around. You can, some of it's editable. Some of it comes from third-party systems. If you've seen Sites 9, you can have a mashup where you have Sites and Docs content appearing in the same uh, site. In this space, you can click around and see the content that is edib editable. So for example, I can see this is the Acadian Solar Panels Home Something. There's an image on there. There's a field in there. If I click on it. I'm focusing on the field, and the user can choose what to do next. We'll progressively uh, disclose and show more information if the user wants to know more. This is a little bit different than the current classic experience manager. Uh, there's a lot of borders that show, and the options are, can be overwhelming. So we simplify this a bit for editors. You can also navigate the page through this content tree so that Sometimes there's content that's hard to find or hard to realize. You can edit it. So here you can see that we have a, a navigation piece. This is an embedded page with some content in there. Here's the main area that I was just in. And inside the main area, there's a component. And that component has a couple of fields. This is new. And it's based off the existing functionality of the breadcrumb here. So if you want to give editors uh, an overview, this Editing space gets, lets you see all the content that's editable, see what it's made of, click on them to select them, and then the user can do a couple things from here. 
One is find out more, and the other is, is editing. So let's find out more about this piece of content. Give me some information. Over here, if you're familiar with sites, we have a couple of uh, different screens or pop-ups that show the relationships of items. How the item is used through a blueprint, how an item is published, how the item is, uh, how's history works. What we found in customer research and when explaining this fe uh, these features, I would ask people, well, have you used the blueprint viewer? And a lot of times the response is, uh, what viewer? These, these commands were hidden in our, in our classic UI, in a ribbon toolbar, where all the functionality is there, but now we've grouped them all up into these item viewers on the left side. For example, you might want to see how is this content used across different pages. And here I see it's used on one page. But it might be, be used on different pages so that when you publish, it gets updated everywhere. If you edit this, it has impact in all these other places. It's important to see how an item is used in uh, blueprinting. I'm seeing if I should uh, ask for a volunteer to help explain uh, blueprinting. Uh, so in, let me pull up a different page here. The biggest difference between sites and docs is the variation and control between sites and docs. So if you have a site, if you're, if you're using sites, the reason why you want to use sites is because you have one general understanding of your content model, that we have this structure, this content, over multiple locations. How many people are using blueprinting? OK, so there's two or three use cases. One is for language. How many people are using blueprinting for language? OK. How many, how many have seen or used it for a B to B to C scenario? Where you have different channels or groups, or say you have one location on a lot of offices or locations around the world, using blueprinting and that kind of, that kind of setup? From the Treaty Insights perspective, those variations are really up to you as a customer. Contrast that with Docs. Docs has the power of the variations in the um, individual pieces of content, your individual topics, that you can use different versions of a topic to create a publication that's used on the delivery side. So if you're ever on the site side and you have the scenario where, well, we want version one of this content here and another version here, we want some contextual content where in the middle of a rich text field this is different, that's where docs might be the better fit for your solution. Okay, so let me show you a little bit more on blueprinting with that uh, blueprinting viewer. Pick an example. Okay, let's pick bead for live. Okay, so what you're seeing here is this is a piece of content that is shared. It comes from a global publication. So in sites, you have uh, layers in your publication where content is created once and it's shared and used throughout your blu uh, blueprint in different publications. Then for those of you doing translation, you might localize this piece of content in different publications so that, for example, in, in here, this piece of content is localized for the Dutch market. And this screen would let you localize or unlocalize or adjust this piece of content across all the different variations that you have in your site. Okay, that's a, the, the blueprint viewer. One of the other things we found when talking to customers is when I asked what would be nice to show in this screen, publish to, a lot of times the, the answer is, oh, it would be so great if you can see how an item is published across the publications and all throughout the blueprint. And that's existing functionality. So we, we're getting hints that the current classic UI is very powerful, has all these capabilities, and people will ask for the same features that we currently have suggesting that maybe there are too many options, they're not visible enough, so we want to make it clear and have all these item viewers readily available. So here I can see that this page is published across five publications. And again, in trading sites, that might be language or businesses or channels or um, whatever you're using your blueprint for, as well as to what environment it's published to, in this case, staging. And finally, we have our history. So 
Uh, versioning is slightly different on the site side than docs. Oh, I need someone to remind me of the difference between versions and revisions. But in, in uh, Tridian sites, the content manager saves versions, and there's always an in-progress version or the latest. And some of those get published. So here you can see all the changes to a piece of content over time. You might roll back, roll forward, delete, or go view what was this content on a given date. So that's the, the history panel. OK, let me go back to, oops, sneak peek here. Um, let me go and make a, a, an edit. So here I'm opening up the component form editor. I had a piece of content. I clicked on it. I'm going to go edit it. One thing we're considering adding or looking to add is this navigation tree on the left side. What we found that uh, customers often have very complicated, long um, schemas. Like one time I had a customer where the schema had so many schema fields, I, I, we, we would measure like the ratio of how tall the component form was to how wide it is. And it was like just incredibly, incredibly long. At that point, you might as well just program the content. But uh, yeah, that's me and content modeling. And in here, you can use this tree to navigate, add uh, new fields. And if you go to a specific field, like here I'm in article body, I can see some rich text. We're spending a bit of time improving the rich text editor. Your, our editors work daily in this editor to copy, paste, clean up, merge, fix, look at source uh, for their pieces of content. And so a couple of things is we'll have the standard uh, shortcuts for um, bold or strong emphasis and whatnot. We also have a source code, source code view, a little bit more hidden than, than typical, where you can look at the, the source for the content. We're introducing full screen editing. So in case you have a very lazy content model where it's just rich text, how many times? How many people have the all-in-one rich text component? No? Where you just say no, no modeling, just all rich text? OK, I see, I see little hands like, like me. <laughs> it's OK. I've, I've been there. Sometimes you do need that flexibility. But you might, have, you might have a scenario where it's rich text, and the editor needs to do all their content, put this in, um, add their whatever the rich text is, one, two, just to tease the semantic modelers amongst all of you. And you can see it's, it's fairly clean, an, or, an ordered list with the list elements here. Okay, um, We're improving the table editing experience. So if I insert a table, I can press a button and pick maybe three, three points. So pros, cons, and there's always, for some reason, a, a notes column in any time you make a table. Let's see, and inserting, let's insert some content. In the item insertion one, I promised Dave I would highlight this. One of our colleagues looked at one of our docs demos and saw the item selector, this item selector, and said, hey, do you see that, Alvin? It looks just like sites. I go, yeah, that's because I sit across the, uh, the way from the docs team. We're reusing the UI elements, reusing uh, shared components to improve both our uh, products. And it's great because occasionally I get to borrow some of the docs developers to work on site stuff, and someday I'll return them. <laughs> <laughs> so here I'm, I'm looking for something to insert. I can go navigate, and I maybe some media, images. So one of the feedback we got was that customers are putting in bigger and bigger um, banners and images in their websites. So we're offering a thumbnail view. And people say, no, that's not big enough. So I said, OK, how about a light box? Is this big enough? So where you can go and look, find the image. A lot of times, if you have a branded video, that first version of the video might be small. So you can pick uh, your image. I get if I could pick. OK, so I picked an image, and then OK. Now my image is here. In the old UI, it was built. Um, I was going to say so long ago. A while ago that we actually had a load images button. So now we just show the images. 
Yeah. Um, and then copy paste, we have a clean paste from Word where you can paste as text. We actually lost that feature because browsers got really strict with the pasting as text. And we'll introduce merge styles uh, uh, after that. And we also have an accessibility checker where you can go and it'll tell me my table's all messed up because I didn't put in the proper captions and I can choose to repair them here, put in the values. Um, example table with pros and cons. And then I can repair it and keep going. Or if I'm not feeling like doing all the accessibility, save it and then update my, my demo. So that's in context editing scenario. And for those that have ever done experience uh, manager project, sometimes the update preview button flashes. I'm looking at Stan, maybe. So here we got rid of that. Now we just show you these are the items that have changed. And then whether or not you're previewing the latest version or not. That's it. There's no more flashing buttons. And that's experience manager. Questions on this in context editing experience UI? Any feedback? Does it like it? Yay, nay. Question, John. Um, is the actual markup for experience manager going to be data attributes now or something other than HTML standards? Yes, data attributes. So there is an idea on Tridian. So if you go to Tridian Sites Community, data attributes for XPM, you'll see someone in the community uh, suggested that. The idea is to make this easier for whatever framework you have. We'll be backwards compatible to the e comments we have. What you do for your application is make sure you have our specific data attributes, and then it would render. And there's an idea on SCL ideas. That's a pitch. And here's an example of, of what the format would be like. So data, page, ID, this, this, and this. And if you like the idea, John, I highly recommend getting on community and upvoting this mm -hmm. so that when we release it, we can say, do by popular demand, uh, we're introducing this, this uh, slight change to the markup. Good question. OK, so the original plan was make experience manager, experience manager better because it looks nice, it's great, it's smaller than everything. But for those of you that looked at the demo, you might go, oh, wow, you have a, a form editor and you have the tree. Why don't you just do everything? So yes, we're doing everything. <laughs> Here's the new Content Manager Explorer. If you notice, it's following our uh, graph graphene system design, where it's also uh, touch friendly. And if all goes well, I'm going to show you this on here in just a moment. And so what are you looking at here? In sites, you typically have lots of publications. You can navigate the, the publications, go into an item. And we show our publication tree as actually a tree. So here's the publications on the left side. You can go to your user favorites. You can see items that are checked out. So if you're an admin or a publication administrator, you can check items back in. And in your site, you can see your pieces of content. And what we're, the changes I showed you in Experience Manager we're introducing here as well. On the right side, you'll see the properties for the individual items. Let me pull that up for you as an example. Um, latest news. And over here, we open up the latest news information. So with this open, you can look at the information across multiple items. A lot of times, you might troubleshoot or you want to check something, and you want to see multiple items. Rather than multiple tabs where we'd open a new screen over and over again, you can keep this open. And as you click on different things, you can see OK, what's the ID for this one? What's the ID for that one? Is this thing published? What about this one? Yeah. Pushma. So the yes. Yeah, I'll, re I'll repeat the question. So historically, the classic UI, we, we have a lot of extensibility. And in the current one, if you do an extension for rich text in one UI editor, it's different than the other. So Experience Manager and CME are actually two different uh, editors in that case. Going forward, in 9.5, you, you won't be able to because there's, we're limiting the amount of extensibility.
But shortly after 9.5, we're looking at how to enable it, and in that case, it will be the same. So if you make a rich text extension, it will be a new format sometime after 9.5, right, Arno? <laughs> it will be the same. So whatever extens extension you make for Experience Manager or the old UI, you'll package it, create it all for, for both UIs at the same time. Good question. Not in 9.5. The focus for 9.5 is daily editorial tasks. Uh, one of the great things about working closer with Docs is we've compared strategies. And so what's Docs, from what I understand, you guys can tell me and give uh, Dave or, or, or Joe, if he's here, a hard time, is Docs has focused on what's needed most for the editors and whatnot. So when they improve things, they took a nice slice of functionality. Here's the new functionality that your editors can use. This is what we need to work on most. Sites historically has done slicing the other way. So we, we've, we've re-architected tiers from bottom up, if you're familiar with Tridian's, uh, Tridian Sites history. And so for the first time, we're taking a really strong stance that that's, this first release is for editors. We do need to make it customizable and offer things for implementers. But the strategy is let's get this done, get this out by 2020 so that we can get editors' uh, experience, daily experience improved, and then we'll address other scenarios as we go along. Uh, the opposite is waiting two, three years for a massive rewrite that's not validated with customers and editors, and I don't think we can wait that long. So, uh, so we had some nice philosophical discussions between the teams, and I'm really glad to be able to focus on you know, just the editorial experience, at least for the first go. Ah, yes. I had notes to, to show that, too. So we have a device previewer. This is not quite an emulator. It just changes the, the view size for you know tablet, landscape, laptop, desktop, and then back. So that's, yeah, that's still some nice functionality if you want to get a feel for what the site might look like across different breakpoints. OK, so for my, my, my last next trick, I'm supposed to open up my tablet and show you that we're offering touch support. OK, and then I turn on my camera, avoid the lights, enter a password. Sorry. I didn't remember it. OK, so can you see this? The tr I was practicing before we started to, to, to get, not get the lights in there while well, this loads. So the touch support will be iPad 9.7 inches is what we're testing. Um, the rest are our are, are best efforts. We wanted to pick a specific device so you can see. And then we focus on. Build to open, close, and all the touch events uh, should work. Double tap to open something, and yeah, that's it. So that, that's coming in, in 9.5 or something. Um, this one's a challenge because when we ask customers, a lot of the feedback is, no, we don't always have devices from the management so side. And then you, we talk to the editors and go, yeah, I tried it, and it works kind of works. and it. it so there's kind of this interest. And by the time my kids grow up, I think there's going to be this expectation that uh, things work on their iPads. <laughs> and that's, that's just around the corner. So this, I think, is a nice first step to offer uh, this for our editors. OK, let's see if I ca caught everything from my demo. Other questions about the new CME, new XPM, before I thank, thank my team. So I work with front end and back end uh, developers proper agile team. Um, occasionally, I steal from, I'm sorry, <coughs> borrow from uh, architects and, uh, and other teams, because this, this is really important to work on. And the idea is that we're, we're working in a better, more effective way. And a lot of these elements will be shared. So when I showed you our tree, our CME, and stuff like that, Docs has uh, similar um, projects or things coming up where we go and, and do a review and get that feedback. Um, one other thing that we're working on is in-context help. So on a specific screen, if you don't know blueprinting, there'll be a help button. Press it, open up the online docs. So there's a couple of nice improvements for editors coming in 9.5. OK, so beyond. 
I mentioned iPad support, one UI. So to push plus point, there's one UI. When we add extensibility, you create it once for both interfaces. We'll add all the basic actions, the information panels, and those rich text area improvements that I mentioned. For beyond, we'll come back to the other less frequently used screens, developer tasks, schemas, settings, workflow, et cetera, proper extensibility, and a uh, consider making the, the REST API public. So we might call it coreservice.rest, which is a joke for those of you that are know, know our old API was tom.net. Clean, uh, paste, and merge, full screen editing, accessibility checker, better table editing, search and replace in, in the active rich text area, insert special characters. That's all coming for uh, editors. And we'll have some things on backwards compatibility. Some, some things have changed, like uh, anchors or bookmarks to named attributes. It's IDs now, so that's going to be a slight change. Um, and then some control over RGB versus hex padding and margins. Questions, answers? You want to give me an answer? What do you guys think? Yes? How many people think that editors would be interested or excited about these changes for, for, for the UI? No? Yes? Ish? Any reasons why they wouldn't be interested? Scared of change. Scared of change. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. So it was like, hey, we've improved and changed everything. Like, mm. The new UI will come separate from the old one. So it's not a wholesale re replacement right away. They'll both be available. And um, so the, the thing is, on the implementer side, you often want to s make sure it works for the use cases, uh, test it before it goes to the editors. Because there's this um, political aspect to it, is you don't want to expose your editors to things that they really don't like. Because it's, it's bad for you, bad for the project, and ultimately bad for the vendor. <laughs> so yes, both of these will be uh, side by side. Yes, that, that reminds me. I, I missed something in my demo. So here is the help screen for, you can see it on the corner, for the online help. And here it's like, like what's new? What are the new features that, that we've introduced in this UI? And this will get redirected internally to our portal. So this is the, our internal portal. But eventually, this will be online, so for sure. The other thing I forgot to show you, since we're, we're a lot of technicals here, is um, this is not going to be product, but this is just a test. I press this button, and I get random colors. And I'm transported back to the days of Windows 3.1. So this is, uh, we use this to test. The UI has proper classes for different elements that, as a developer on my team, you need to match. So if one of these doesn't change properly, it means you, didn't, you, you hard coded some color. Uh, so this is one to just show off that maybe we can introduce some, some theming. One of the popular requests is, we want a dark mode for your UI. Like that's, I don't see it on SEL ideas yet, so maybe someone might want to put it on there, and we'll start upvoting it. But uh, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, something we have. So help, yeah. And then that just reminded me that we have this little um, button. And this error and extension piece is intentional. This is the uh, idea that. Well, we're looking at how we would extend this UI in the front end, um, but that's still early days. This extens full extensibility won't be in 9.5, but it'll be coming shortly, sometime after, whenever Arno wants it. <laughs> OK. I think that's it for me. If you're not on community, please do sign up. If you come to the user group, I'm going to have everybody join. So uh, go to community.scl.com. What we'll go through is some of the ideas. And there's a lot of great ideas, but from the product perspective, a lot of times we need context and examples. And when we ask questions, we're not getting answers on community. So we want to run that session on the user group for sites to, get, uh, to, to make these, kind of groom these requests to, to a better state so that we can uh, better interpret them and prioritize them, specifically for the, the column. So the column I showed you, there's like 50 million ideas and I'd, I'd, I can put them all, but then it probably wouldn't be uh, usable. 
All right. Thank you. If you have any questions or if you want to see the demo, come talk to me uh, afterwards. And thank you so much for your time, uh, for coming out and uh, connecting with everybody. Okay. Thanks.